Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if you find this interesting and would like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. I say listeners and viewers because it's in both podcast form and video form. And uh, so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, um, even a modest monthly donation makes a significant difference if enough people do it. Uh, then there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And there's also a page about donations which explains a little bit why we ask for them and gives you alternative ways of making them. <clears throat> My guest today is an old friend of mine, Steve Briggs, who's sitting here. Um, Steve and I have known each other for decades because of our background in the TM movement, Transcendental Meditation. Um, we had adventures together in France and Switzerland and India and now Iowa, <clears throat> where I see Steve several times a week because I go up to the gym and he teaches tennis up there. Um, Steve... Uh, was a sort of a tennis prodigy in uh, in his youth, as he'll probably be talking about here, and you know went to uh, the University of Arizona on a tennis scholarship. Um, he, I would say, his main uh, love though is spirituality, which there's probably some overlap. And tennis can have a spiritual dimension, as I think we'll actually be discussing, um, and so consequently. Uh, he met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi at a meditation retreat in the Swiss Alps in uh, probably the 70s. 73. 73. And um, eventually became a TM teacher and uh, spent a lot of time in India, um, seven years actually, teaching TM to corporate executives. But during that time, he also traveled around and went to the Himalayas many times where he encountered many yogis and sadhus. And he has some interesting stories about that. Um, Steve is a devotee of Mata Amritananda Mai, Ama, who we met in India in 1996. And um, he still practices TM, has been doing that for the past 46 years. And he credits Maharshi, his guru, uh, with showing him the path to enlightenment. Um, Steve has written two books. The first is India Mirror of Truth, which came out about 15 years ago or yeah, so. 2006. 2006, which um, I read at the time, found it fascinating. And a more recent, and this is nonfiction, uh, chronicling Steve's adventures in India. Um, and this one is fiction, but also based largely on his experience with yogis and saints and so on. Um, tale of, the Tale of the Himalayan Yogis. I've been reading that one, and um, I'd forgotten. Well, I'd never you'd never read, written any fiction before, so, so that was, was the first try. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought, wow, I, I couldn't possibly do this. You know, somehow you just turn turn the stuff out. Well, when I got to the University of Arizona, where I went to uh, to, pl to ostensibly to be a tennis player on a scholarship, and mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be a creative writing major. Yeah. I went into a creative. Uh, writing seminar mm -hmm. with graduate students and, and a, an, a, an author professor and I was totally intimidated uh. by the things I was asked to write and read yeah. and I immediately shifted over to literature and I uh. didn't write for a long time uh. because it was just more that my confidence level in my writing at that time so I left it for some time but you know eventually things that you love to do, you get back to it. Yeah. So I started writing. And they say if you want to be a good writer, read good writing. And so you must have done that, a lot of that as a literature major. Yeah. I no, I thoroughly it. found it to read uh, Shakespeare and, and whoever else I read. It was just a, a real great experience. For yeah. Me. Abraham Lincoln did that. He read Shakespeare every day and he credited you know, his love of good, good writing with his eloquence and ability to, to speak I well. Yeah. And of course, many others say that as well. I guess there will be two aspects to this interview. One we could say is the inner aspect, mm -hmm. and the other the outer aspect. The inner aspect being you know, your subjective development over these decades, and the outer aspect would be some of the very interesting experiences you've had and people you've encountered and so on. Um, so maybe we should start with the inner aspect. I mean, just 
right off the bat when you learned to meditate, was your experience significant? And, and actually, prior to learning to meditate, did you have any kind of spiritual inclinations even as a much younger person? I was in college when I learned to meditate, and the very first time I sat down and, and quote, transcended, <clears throat> I was given a mantra, sat down for 10 minutes to meditate in the room. My first thought after I had the experience was, I've had that before. Mm. I've clearly had that experience before. And the reason why I believe I could say that, uh, honestly, is because uh, as a young tennis player, growing up in athletics in a, in a family that was just crazy over sports, um, I started playing tournament tennis when I was six years old and got into the national tournaments, I think, by the time I was nine or ten. I was playing all around the country. And I, by the time I was 15, my brother and I, he was two years older, we got to be pretty uh, well-established, highly ranked players. And I was playing a guy on the stadium court in, the, in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, at the, at the U.S. National Junior Championships. He was ranked like 10th in the country from Pacific Palisades, California. Mm -hmm. And it was a really close match, and I was having a big problem uh, picking up the ball. The balls back then were white, not picking up from the ground, but picking up See. his shot, seeing the ball. The backgrounds had a, a red, white, and blue banner behind the server, and every time he served, I'd lose it in the banner. Yeah. And I thought, well, i got to do something about this fast because I'm not getting into the points the way I should be. And I started focusing more, and I started focusing more and trying different things because I really you know, had to pick up, you have to pick up the ball, um, see the ball. And as a result, that increased focus and, and obviously big desire to win. I was playing on the stadium court. There were probably 1,500 people watching uh, in this uh, stadium. And a shift started to occur, and it took about 10 minutes to fully occur, but it was an internal shift. Nothing in the match was really changed. We were 50-50. He, he won the first set. I won the second set. But we're getting down to the final stages of the match, and this huge shift occurred, and I started to be uh, very lucid internally. My mind was picking up the things he was about to do, but he hadn't done them yet. So I, I was sort of like, okay, I've got a real advantage here. I, I sensed where he was going to serve. I knew where he was going to hit the ball. And I was a step ahead of him. I was a step ahead of what I usually did as a tennis player. And I went on and won the match, and that put me in a great position in the national tournament. I had no idea what had happened, except I knew something in my awareness had changed. Hmm. Not just being more alert, but I was... Because you can be more alert driving, but you don't necessarily know maybe what's going to happen a moment before it happens. It, it may be that way, but I felt almost prescient. I just said, this is cool. And then I started finding out that other tennis players, and not, of course, only tennis players, but skiers and joggers and basketball players, they talked about being in what they referred to as the zone. Mm -hmm. And back then, that was a layman's term. Getting in the zone meant everything. And people used to say, Michael Jordan, he's in the zone again, because he would just kill everybody and make 10 shots in a row. So I, I identified that, okay, I was in the zone. But then the next question, you know, two months later was, all right, so I was in the zone. Is it, was it an accident? Could I have that again? Could I have it regularly? Could I find some way to make it happen? Because that's a huge competitive advantage. And I didn't know of any way or means to make it happen other than to try to re redo the same things that it didn't, didn't work the next time. Mm. Okay, so then we fast forward to uh, high school. We're back in school. I'm a sophomore at uh, Rock Island High School. And my AP English uh, lit teacher said, okay, pick one of four novels. And she wrote the names on the, on the board. And the fourth uh, title was totally different than the other ones, which were uh, clearly English-type titles. And the fourth one was Siddhartha. Mm. Herman Hesse. So I, I chose that out on a whim, and I read it, and I thought, oh, there's something really unique here embedded in what he's saying, because it was a story of two friends who uh, went to meet uh, the Buddha, and one friend stayed with the Buddha, and the other one loved his wisdom, but, i uh, sorry, loved who he represented, who Buddha embodied, but decided to go on his own path. But both were on a big spiritual lifetime path. So uh, after reading that, I started thinking, Maybe I should meditate. Maybe I should do some yoga. But, you know, how do you do that on your own? You know, yeah. you get a book from the library in, the, in 1968 or something, and you don't go very far. So, Siddhartha kind of got me going. Yeah, I think... It, Him and it, Timothy Leary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So that was a kind of the jump start of officially in my mind knowing there was something that I thought uh, might help me. And it just so happened that it came from the East. I, you know, I, I read, you know, in reading the book, I realized that this was an Indian story of two Indian boys who uh, chartered their spiritual path. And that didn't lead me very far except to experiment. And then very soon, when I, my first year in college, two, year, two three years later, I then I got to TM. Saw a poster or something. Yeah, yeah, saw a poster in a Shakespeare classroom. And it was like Marshy's picture was there, and he kept... I kept turning to the picture, and I think you know, we're studying King Lear or whatever, <laughs> turning to the picture, and of course, the picture won. So I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, King Lear didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, so you learned, and you had this profound experience, and you, you, it was reminiscent of... Yeah, and the day of, yeah. of instruction, we went in and sat down, and my teacher... Uh, had been to Europe to be with Maharishi and he came and gave me this instruction and a mantra and I sat down and you know I just sunk into like into a lake I just went to the bottom sat there and when I came out I said I've had that I had that before and maybe now this will be how I can replicate it and and and, and do something for my tennis and honestly within six months my game took a big uh, step forward and by the spring of our, we had a very good team at Arizona. We were top 10 NCAA every year that I was there. Uh, and we had five of our eight players were uh, meditating, wow. much to the disappointment of our coach because we were meditating when he wanted to sit down to breakfast in the hotel and, <laughs> and talk to us. So we were always, he, I don't know what his real feelings were, but anyway, we, we were pretty uh, dedicated because everyone, we were, we were all playing very well as a result. That's great. And, um, not long after that, I'll just add one more bit about the tennis. Uh, we actually taught a lot of the top players in the world, Arthur Ashe and so forth, to meditate. And two or three of them said the same thing. I've had this experience before. Mm. So uh, more recently, I came across a book about how to develop children's potential mm -hmm. in life, um, about uh, a substance or, or, or a quality in the brain in the, that surrounds the neurons called myelin. Um, and the book was titled The Talent Code by a guy named Daniel Coyle. And Daniel Coyle went all over the world to find out what were the commonalities, what were the common features in places like Brazil, where they have an inordinate amount of great soccer players, Moscow, Russia, where there are a ridiculously high number of great uh, tennis players. Uh, he went to North Korea, where the women have dominated uh, the pro golf scene. They, they make maybe 15 of the top 30 women are from North Korea. It's just yeah. outrageous. Dominican Republic in baseball. Dominican Republic in baseball, some little town in Texas that had a lot of country western singers. And this uh, study that he did was to see if, if something that surrounds the neuron in the brain called myelin, if that, that sheath was somehow enhanced or made stronger as a result of repeated uh, athletic performance or musical performance or dance performance uh, where you train uh, rigorously and with focus but in a joyful way. And that's what they found. They found that um, people who spend long hours in focused activities, people who do things they're passionate about, um, do develop this myelin sheathing of the neurons and that myelin gives a smoother, more consistent, um, more effective, more efficient uh, transfer of information through the brain uh, to, to other parts of the body. And that's very much helpful yeah. in, in performance. And, and, and imagine the analogy of these 16-year-old Olympic uh, girls who are gold medalists in ice skating. They just, they perform these mind-boggling a gymnastical feats on skates in front of how many millions of people and they they've repeated that performance so many times that is second nature for them and their brain finds its way through the uh, the brain functioning uh, is benefited by this uh, myelin sheathing that helps uh, kind of avert the nervous neurons and all those types of things and they perform spectacularly under the most uh, heavy pressure. Yeah. What always gets me is these little girls that can do backflips on a balance oh beam my. and stuff oh like my. that. Yeah, the, be the beam's only a few, yeah, it's a few yeah. inches wide. Um, and I, I believe, I mean, a, a neurophysiologist could comment a lot more eloquently, but I believe that um, destruction or deterioration of the myelin sheath is 
involved in such diseases as you know, multiple scler sclerosis and, and all. Um, yeah. And, you know, I know there's research on meditation which shows a, a, a thickening of the frontal cortex and actual re physical restructuring of the brain in people who have been meditating for a long time. And the term neuroplasticity is very popular. Um, a guy I interviewed named Rick Hansen is, um, you know, one of the primary authors about that. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, if you look at America's really f into athletic heroes, you know, mm -hmm. you've got your... Um, Tiger Woods just won Tiger the Woods, tournament yeah, in five yeah. years. Yeah. You had Steph Curry, LeBron James, and Michael Jordan. And and from Europe, you've got, uh, in tennis, you've got uh, Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal. And, and uh, Serena Williams, of course, uh, who grew yeah. up in Los Angeles, lives in Florida, I believe. Um, these are <laughs> role models for yeah. many, many, many millions of kids. Yeah, you, and, you told me the New York Times did an article entitled yeah. Roger Federer as Religious Experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, he, when you see him, he looks like a Barishnikov. It, it's, it's balletic, what he does. It's so graceful, so yeah. coordinated, so transcendent, so effortless, it appears. Yeah. Now, we don't see what he does behind the scenes. We don't see all the work he puts in to develop the brain physiology and the mm -hmm. physical uh, skills, but... We see the beautiful end product, and he, he doesn't ever want to quit. He just loves old doing it. Now. He's 37, mm -hmm. which is not old as human beings go, but it's ancient. Old for it's yeah. very old for tennis because uh, the wheels, the legs. And he's still winning. Yes, he's yeah. still number two in the world, and he's uh, got 20 Grand Slams. Wow, that's great. Okay, well, this interview is not going to be all about sports, but um, it's important. I mean, it's important to have a healthy body, for one thing. I mean, most of us aren't going to be professional athletes, but the body is the vehicle through which enlightenment or evol spiritual evolution takes place. And this is one thing I realized when I was about 18 and had been, you know, damaging my vehicle for some time. <laughs> I, I realized, you know, you're stuck in this body. Yeah. And if you damage it, you're going to be stuck all of your life in a damaged body. So I thought, that's it. I'm going to stop taking drugs, learn to meditate, and, you know, turn it around. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it, tennis is one of many, many great, you know, the musicians and dancers. Are, but it, the interesting thing with tennis specifically is that it began, it had a bit of a spiritual religious uh, uh, beginning. It, it was very popular in European mon monastic life. It huh. was an indoor game was slightly different, but it was played with an uh, early version of a racket and a ball, and the, the monks used to, the monastics used to go in uh, after their lunch and, or sometime during the afternoon and, and hit it around. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Actually, it feels good if you spend a lot of your time meditating to do something rather strenuous. Yes. Uh, you know, it helps to integrate and counterbalance all Interesting that. Interesting enough, probably that early version of tennis was more like your game, pickleball, uh -huh. because it, uh, I don't think it had strings in the rackets and the balls were not the same as a tennis ball, but uh -huh. it was very popular and, it, and then it became a, a sport that the kings in France and, and England uh, took up. Yeah, so, you know, you're, you learned to meditate in the early 70s, probably about 45 years ago or more, mm -hmm. or almost about that much, and um, you know, so if you look back over those 45 years, are there like milestones that stand out in your memory as, uh, in terms of your subjective development as being significant shifts of some sort? I'd say there are three or four. I've given some thought to that over the years, and there are three or four, and three of them related to saint or guru figures. Okay. And we can start with those if Let's we like. Through. Okay. Well, the first one was in the early 90s, I was visiting with Maharshi uh, in Holland. He had moved from Switzerland to Holland. And he was preparing us for this project that I spent seven years in India doing, teaching TM to corporates, and which uh, was what this memoir uh, travel book was about. And I was sitting with Maharshi one night with a couple of the other people who were on their way to India with me, and he kept looking over my head. Like, I don't know why, but I just noticed he's looking over my head. And I was feeling a little uncomfortable, like, what's he seeing? You know, <laughs> you, you know I, didn't, little, I didn't have a lot. in your aura. I didn't know. have a lot of skeletons in the closet, <laughs> but I'm sure everyone has a couple. Uh -huh. and I'm sure I had some. But nothing else happened. But then that night, I was uh, awake in the night in my room. The room was perfectly black with, with curtains blocking out uh, all the uh, light from, the, from outside. And Marshy 
popped into my awareness. He wasn't in the room physically, let's make that clear. But he popped into my awareness in a very clear manner, didn't say a word to me. And he just smiled and it's like he reached inside my torso and took both hands and took what appeared to be one pipe here and one pipe here, uh -huh. some, I presume be some part of my physiology and stuck them together. Huh. And when he left, then he was gone. He yeah. was like, this is like the most efficient plumber. <laughs> it's like, I came to do this. And we're not having any conversation. Don't even ask me what I'm doing. And then he was, he vanished. But everything shifted big time. Yeah. Inside, everything shifted to uh, what was prior to that kind of a half-light inner awareness that I was sitting there with to a brilliant, uh, at times golden, shimmering awareness. Um, the rest of the night was uncharacteristic in the sleep. I don't think I was ever unconscious at all the rest of the night and the next day I in other up, words you were your body was sleeping I, but your but inner, I was yeah. your inner awareness was awake yeah, it's yeah. what sometimes people call witnessing, witnessing sleep yeah. I don't say that I was sitting above my body looking down but I was wide awake but I could hear my breath yeah uh, he, when it got heavy and so on and sometimes even a light snore but I was fully aware of all that so I knew I was sleeping I just want to yeah. throw in a point here which is that you know witnessing is often talked about and either in sleep or in waking state and it's not a disassociative thing where some part of you has stepped aside or stepped back and is witnessing the other part of you it's more like you know your essential nature which is pure consciousness which is not an individuated thing has become awake to itself and there's a uh, there's a contrast between that and the, the individual and the individual activities and um, so and because of the nature of that is pure silence it often feels like well I'm doing stuff but I'm not doing anything at all or I'm asleep and yet I'm not asleep you know and and your senses may not be functioning even so it's not like you could even be thinking about it uh, if you're fast asleep you, you, all that can be shut down and yet that inner awareness yeah. persists and that inner awareness can be just uh, described equally well when people are in dynamic activity and that yeah. was a great description of it and that's what <clears throat> sometimes athletes describe I remember Michael Jordan he come off of a game uh, for the NBA championships and he was just in his zone and he would say hey I was just watching myself do this it was like I wasn't even doing it yeah. and Steph Curry has said that kind of thing yeah. and and I that was a little bit of the experience I had that first kind of taste of higher consciousness when I was playing that match I mentioned in yeah. Michigan uh, when I was 15, 16 years old. Another, just to, to add a point to that is, I wanted to make, emphasize that because some people do misconstrue witnessing as something one should do or try to do. Uh -huh. I was interviewing a guy one time and, he, and we, we got onto the subject of witnessing. He said, yeah, I can witness. And he kind of went into this little bit strange state where his, he, he was a little vacant and I, he, he couldn't talk with me quite so fluently and everything. And uh, w witnessing should, if anything, enhance your functionality, not um, totally. detract from it if it's real, actual witnessing in the way that was traditionally meant or understood. That experience with Marshy was about two weeks before he sent us, uh, a couple of us, to India to do this project that I had mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I was carrying with me a book about Swami Ramakrishna's life. And Ramakrishna um, was a Bengali, and he was a great devotee, a great bhakta uh, devotee of Kali. Mm -hmm. And I was reading about his life, and it was all much of it was about his relationship with this uh, aspect of Divine Mother, Kali. And by the time I got to India, I'd finished the book, but I hadn't finished somehow with Kali. Mm -hmm. Because I walked into my room at the ashram, we were staying in an ashram outside of Delhi, one of Maharshi's uh, ashrams. Mm -hmm. Noida. Noida. Yeah. And in the guest room I walked, there was a, a substantial uh, painting. It was an original painting of Kali and some of her different aspects. And I would sit down in our assignment, Maharshi said, okay, you're going to go and you're going to meditate for X number of hours before you go to town and meet all your appointments and then you're going to come back. So we had a very we were on his brahmachari uh, routine at that time, so we were supposed to meditate five, six hours a day, in spite of the fact that we were in addition to in addition to running into New Delhi. Yeah, yeah, in addition. And so I would sit there, and as I was so immersed in the story of Swami Ramakrishna and Kali, I kept having my attention pulled away from my meditation mantra, and I kept falling it kept falling on Kali mm. I kept looking at Kali and it wasn't just like okay I'm looking at the picture on the wall but the picture was internalizing internalizing itself to a great extent and eventually I stopped looking at 
her picture on the wall and started looking at her, my imagination maybe, or my vision of her within me. Mm. And it was not one dimensional. It mm. was like it would inspire or generate what I would call a feeling of liquid light. Mm -hmm. And that liquid light would, like a liquid, would begin to fill up my physiology. And as it filled up, I would find that my breathing and my thoughts were just on the way out. Mm -hmm. And as it really filled up, then that all subsided. I mean, there, I don't think the breath was totally gone, but the thoughts, it was such a relief to find there's no thoughts here. And I'm just sitting here and I'm, I'm having this uh, beautiful transcendent experience with um, this aspect of Divine Mother, free from thought, free from ever wanting to have thought again, hmm. and just sitting there for hours at a time, no mantra, nothing, just Kali, the sense of Kali, or the image of Kali, one or the other would always be there, and she would appear or present herself at 3 a.m., and I'd get up, and I'd had a long day, and I'd get up, and I'm not going to lie down when, when I have this opportunity. So I got really immersed in Kali, and very soon after that, the first trip that we made for our, our corporate work, we were flown to Calcutta, which is the home of Kali, mm. and while we were there visiting... Because, because Ramakrishna is Yeah, there. yeah, and, and they were all Kali Bhaktas long before uh, Ramakrishna, but he became the head head priest at the most uh, two, one of the two most famous Akali temples, Dakshineshvar, on the Ganges. Mm. They call it the Hooghly, but it's the Ganges River. And so we were flown into a cement company, did our meetings, and as we were leaving, we, we said, can we visit this Kali temple? Uh, I was with a friend, uh, in part, Lane Weiger. Lane, yeah. And so they took us to this temple, and again, it was like she came out of the, the statue, you know, the Murtis there of Kali, and it just like out of her statue into me, and I just thought, wow, now, I didn't know anything about Kali three months prior. <laughs> Obviously, I did, but I didn't consciously. Yeah. And I just got further and further immersed in her world. And it wasn't that much longer when I met uh, Amma. Mm. And my experience with Amma was that, again, there's this Kali quality about her that, to me, was unmistakable. And I think some other devotees of hers have uh, recognized that and even maybe written about it. But she, I met her... Uh, as a result of a a CEO of Hughes Communications, a very big satellite communications company in India, and he said, would you like to meet a saint? And I said, absolutely, and it turned out to be Amma, and it was at her ashram near the uh, Indira Gandhi airport. And I was, my jaw dropped. I just couldn't believe the power of a human being, uh, of this human being. And I thought to myself, I don't know who she is. I haven't, you know, heard much about her. But it's just his friend took me innocently, and I just. But I want to know more. And I thought to myself, if there's a Mahatma on this in this world of that power, because she hugged us all, yeah. then I think it'd be an, a big mistake not to see her when I could. Yeah. And I started. I saw her seeing her when I could. And when I got back to the U.S., of course, we were lucky. She came to Iowa, and I don't know what to call her: Saint, Guru, uh, Mahatma. Davy, hmm. all I know is that um, that led to a second uh, kind of darshan type uh, awakening, which was when Amma came to Cedar Rapids uh, that year. There was an announcement at the public uh, meeting the first day, would anyone be willing to iron some of Amma's saris hmm. for this thing called Davy Baba, which you know. So I thought, I know how to iron. So I went over and I'm, you know, I'm this guy, there's three ironing boards and I'm ironing, you know, these silk saris and two ladies are ironing. And I, I'm thinking, I didn't think anything of it because I was a single, actually I wasn't single at that time, but I'd been single for all those years prior, ironing my own shirts for these meetings, uh, you know, around when we do TM stuff, we always had to wear dress shirts. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think anything of it. And then I was told, you can go sit near Ama. Mm -hmm. you, you just go sit near Ama. And so I went and sat down there and she had an assistant right next to her, and, and the lady whispered in my ear, she says, Amma wants you to massage her feet. I remember that. I remember you massaging she, her feet for she, like half an hour. Yeah, and she says, Amma wants you to massage her. I said, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, she just she said, don't rub too hard, but just, you know, take hold of both, you know, yeah. both her feet in both your hands and just gently. Mm -hmm. So I go, you know, great. And I'll tell you, 
the lights went on and another awakening and I, I'm using the word awakening I wouldn't say awakened mm -hmm. at, you know but more was there more was added and I was just floating for yeah. days I mean, yeah. just thought and I just you know really re realized and res respected the fact that a human being of a substantially higher vibration whether it's Ama or Maharshi the first time I saw Maharshi and he and he and I gave him a flower I was just you know, dumbfounded at, at how powerful his eyes, his gaze was. So these special individuals can really bestow and give grace uh, to an individual at, at, a, at a time when they want to. And I just, so that was a big awakening for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, this AMA that we're talking about, if anybody's curious, it's AMA.org, A-M-M-A.org, if you want to check her out. She goes all over the world. Yeah, I had an experience one time that my mother had, you know, had a rough life with my father being rather abusive and she'd tried to commit suicide three mm. times and she'd mm. been in and out of mental hospitals during most of my adolescence. Mm. And, um, you know, then I got into TM and got into teaching and got over and was over in Switzerland. And, and um, she was, I, I asked Marshi if she could come over there and he agreed. And so she came over and spent nine months. But the first time she saw him, she was at, um, you know, 20, 30 feet away as he was coming into the hall and he came along giving people flowers or being, yeah. being people giving him flowers and so on. And then he got up to us and, you know, my mother handed him a flower and he handed her a flower and, and he looked at me and said, keep her happy. And then he, he walked on up to his couch and then she turned to me and her whole face was different. It was like, and she, she looked at me and she said, he looks right into your soul. Oh, you know, and she stayed there nine months and was never back in mental hospitals. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it really transformed her. Very perceptive thing that she said. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have had that experience. You, you see videos of people seeing Marshy for the first time or being hugged by Ama on a video and the tears. You know, yeah, sometimes big football player types. Yeah, how many times you've seen they're coming away from the hug and it's just tears are streaming down their face or their sh body's even shaking because yeah. they've had this... Uh, huge relief of stress from their life. Yeah. Uh, maybe something traumatic had happened and they've just been been relieved of it. I think what's cool about it, among other things, is just um, that it's an example of what a human being can become. You know, it's an example, even though you can't totally fathom her subjective status or, or experience or anything, That, but there's something so evidently so extraordinary that you know if, especially if you watch her for hours on end and you think oh, how could a person do this or be like this it, it gives you a sort of a broader for more profound sense of the possibilities for human life well if you those two examples were were kind of focusing on right now and if you look at their lifestyle i mean the times i've spent with marashi in in switzerland he would sometimes meet with us until 3 a.m. and we'd be exhausted. And we were like prime of our life age-wise, 30 years old, and we'd be exhausted. And we, he'd say, you guys go to, go to bed now. And then another group would come in. Yeah. And then his secretary said, well, it's late, Marshy. He said, oh, yeah, we'll go to bed. And he would continue, and the sun was coming up. And we know from seeing Ama that she works, that she, she functions that way without yeah. stopping and hugs For hundreds of thousands of people every year, and it goes on like that. So those are, uh, that's kind of like, being plugged into the big, big power source, yeah. and we're trying to get there, and we're we're improving. We're adding more wattage to our capacity over mm -hmm. time. I think. Yeah, I think. Well, we talked about the brain undergoing transformation. I think that there are other dimensions to our to the instrument which have to also be transformed. <clears throat> subtle body and you know stuff like that. There was one more awakening that I thought I would you know like to address, and this one was completely based in a phrase that um, I like to use sometimes called perception without the senses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if I hope this will make reasonable sense. I think it will. You know, human beings live in a physical vibrational world where we see trees, we see each other, we, we see animals, and we, we live on that level. And if we give any credence to the various religious scriptures around the world or the things that religious and spiritual leaders, uh, Mahatmas might say, they'll say, well, you see that range of creation, but you should know that there are greater possibilities in creation than what you can physically see. Mm -hmm. There are lower levels uh, below a human being, which we might call a suric, even demonic, rakshasic, uh, those are Sanskrit terms for, for that level, 
or and there, there may well be um, levels higher than the human level, which we could call angelic or devic or godlike or something. And the only reason we don't see it is because our eyes and senses are not developed enough to go beyond this certain range of sense experience. Just the way you've got a dog, and dogs can hear things that we far can. better than humans. Yeah, and smell. And smell, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think a bear, the smell of a bear, a bear can smell like a hundred or a thousand times better than a human being. So mm-hmm. we may not pick up the scent of a strawberry uh, from 200 yards away, but the bear can. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean the strawberry is not there. It just means that we don't have the sensory apparatus or the development of those senses to appreciate it. And I think that analogy is appropriate for other levels of creation. Um, And I preface this other awakening because this one was completely without the use of the senses. And I was just, you know, awake in meditation. And again, it was a Maharshi experience and it was only a few months ago. Um, He just appeared, did not see him at all, not an iota with my physical eyes Mm -hmm. or hear him with my ears, but he appeared and both hands on my head. And again, there wasn't any communication, but it was completely an internal experience. And then he left. uh, And that one left me reeling for, I mean, reeling in a very positive way. Uh, And I found that very unexpected because Marshy passed away 10 years ago. And, you know, I've never abandoned Marshy, but I haven't been thinking a lot about him, uh, you know, since he left. Um, And it almost was a surprise to me, but it was a very, very expansive experience and a very welcomed experience. And again, a reminder. And I don't think awakening, so my three uh, awakening uh, anecdotes were all with uh, guru saints. But awakenings, I'm sure you've done this uh, interview so many times that you've heard a thousand different vehicles for having an awakened experience, maybe a river. Maybe, you know, when Siddhartha got his awakened experience at the end of, the of Hesse's of the book, river. it was the flow of the river. Yeah. And the wisdom of a very simple ferryman mm-hmm. who hardly had anything to say. So, who was it? Eckhart Tolle talks about somebody who got awakened looking at a cat watching a mouse hole. <laughs> because, because of the sort of presence and focus of the yeah. cat, he kind of entrained with that. And that was the trigger to his awakening. <laughs> My, my experience of various levels of awakening, uh, it always begins internally with this thing of filling up with what I would like to refer to as liquid light. I think it's a quality of prana and a quality of consciousness that uh, blends together and just fills up. Maybe it's a, ten, it's a physical feeling of pure consciousness. I can't say, but it feels liquidy mm-hmm. to me. Three-dimensional, it doesn't feel like it's... Uh, less than that, maybe multi-dimensional. And then when it fills up, I feel like I'm free. Mm. I feel like um, My cup I away. can very easily just float up into what might be conveniently called higher reality or cosmic reality or divine reality. And then I really feel like I'm closer to who uh, I want to be or who I am becoming. Then you feel like you, f- you lose it again? I consciously um, end my meditation, you know, at a certain point. Uh, and to me, when people say, "Are you have you had an are you awakened?" and I'll say, "I can't really answer that." I'm, I see you'd have to ask someone else because I'm kind of stuck with this idea that I know of, like Ananda Maima, the great Indian saint. She could sit in samadhi for days at a time. Yeah. I sit down and I can meditate for hours at a time. <laughs> you know, you can too. But days? Uh, I've never done that. And I don't know that it would be appropriate. (laughs) I don't know if, you know, and I don't know what state of of consciousness that requires. If it's more or greater, I I can't say, but it's somehow uh, I can't fly. Well, that brings a couple of questions up. I mean, one is that, you know, if flying were the criterion for, or, or the acid test for being awakened, then pretty much nobody is um, that we know of, um, although there are his, historical anecdotes. 
Um, also, St. Francis. Yeah, St. Francis, St. Joseph of Cupertino, and many others. But uh, if if being able to meditate for days on end is a criterion for awakening, then that too could be a problem. I mean, you, we could presume that somebody like Ama could do it, but she doesn't do it. I she think she might have when she was younger. Maybe she when she was younger. sitting on the beach. And... Yeah, she'd go into samadhi, and she'd actually be walking along, and she'd think of Krishna or something, and she'd just fall to the ground in, in samadhi, or uh, even like using the the toilet over the over the backwater uh, she'd fall in or something. <laughs> but, uh, but um anyway i don't we have to be careful i think no, establishing no, uh, there are no criterion yeah. there uh, i do think it would be beneficial in many most possibly most circumstances to be in a a holier place might help uh, along a holy river and although it, it certainly could happen anywhere i would imagine yeah. And also when you say, you know, if people ask you if you're awakened, um, there, I react to that the same way I react to the word enlightened or, or enlightenment. There's a sort of a superlative static connotation to it, which in my experience with all these hundreds of people I've interviewed, uh, I've never seen an example of. I mean, maybe they have reached some terminus point and I'm not able to appreciate it, but I really have gotten the impression that everybody is a work in progress. If you're still breathing, mm-hmm. and even if you've stopped breathing and you've gone on to some other level, the, the range of, of potential unfoldment is vast. I think that's a great way to phrase it, a work in progress. Yeah. And I don't think we'd want it any other way. Uh, I, I would always look forward to the idea that there's something more out there. I, I, have a, I could say I have an adventuresome side of me, and I always mm-hmm. look, and whether it's going inward or going uh, on a pilgrimage or a vacation, I always feel like, oh, I'd like to have a new experience. And I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah. And to, just to put a fine point on that, um, when you say I'd like to have a new experience, that sort of gives the impression that enlightenment or awakening is an experience which may come and go like the way sensory experiences do but what we're talking about here is something which the the appreciate the awakening to something which abides and which which is you know the unreal has no being the real never ceases to be so you know the ephemeral experiences may come and go whereas this baseline is established which doesn't yeah i like that old analogy of maharshi's where you're sitting in a really comfortable warm bathtub and uh-huh. you're just sitting and it's quietly and you can say that the warm bath water is being you know you're just immersed in this abiding soothing quality of being and then maybe at some point in the bath you might want to slosh around slosh around and move the waves that and when i say a new experience i'm referring to sloshing the waves around a little bit and and experiencing on that level and having it be that much more rewarding and enriching as a as a result of having a foundation which is uh, abiding and non-changing underneath it. Yeah, which actually, you know, Maharishi did change his emphasis a little bit in the late 70s from just transcending and, you know, getting established in the the transcendent to stirring it up and, you know, practicing the city program in in order to enliven specific channels. Yeah, it... (laughs) I was thinking about the the mantra for for a second in that what role does it have in in this whole process because many people are taught you know the mantra is a meaningless sound uh-huh. but as time went by and as I was living in India and having these uh, these Devi kind of awakening experiences a part of my experience that morphed into an experience that my mantra became the most meaningful word in my life. Mm. Um, in Sanskrit, mo- mantras we can uh, understand are Sanskrit words that are in the Vedic scriptures, um, many of which are, are said, and I think Ramakrishna said it about as, as well as anyone, that a, a mantra is like an acorn, and within the acorn is the, the oak tree, mm-hmm. and the mantra within the mantra is the form of, uh, of the God which you are thinking about or meditating yeah, on. Enlivening or invoking. Enlivening. Or... And so I think that's a process of self-discovery mm-hmm. and that's a part of the discovery that I realized that here I was sitting not even knowing if my mantra had anything other than a, a soothing effect, which yeah. I was told. Then I came to the cognition or realization that my mantra was an aspect of this divine feminine mm-hmm. that um, that charmed me so much when I saw Ama and when I uh, 
when I saw the picture of Kali, I went to the Kali temple. Uh, it just, it all started, the pieces started to fit together. Yeah, yeah, traditionally and more esoterically, mantras are considered to be sort of, not, it seems, it's crude to say names of gods. No, um, they're, they're sort of um, auditory representations of, of prime, primal impulses of intelligence. Yeah. And okay. um, there's, a, uh, there's a verse in the Gita that says, you, you support the gods and they support you. Yeah. And there's sort of this reciprocal relationship that gets established in using a mantra, a correct mantra correctly, in which um, somehow or other, I, I'm just speaking off the cuff here, but somehow or other that, those primal, that primal impulse of, of intelligence that's um, imbibed or embedded in your mantra, um, you begin to align with that, and and it supports your life. I mean, so a mantra is not only for transcending; it actually results in what we might call of support of nature or support of divine intelligence in order to more evolutionarily um, orchestrate yeah. your life. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of sayings in, in scriptures, and one of them that I've always <clears throat> made a lot of sense, you are what you meditate on, you are what you think, you are what your attention... You, that to which you give your attention grows stronger grows in your Grows stronger, life. Uh, and you become that. And I can't imagine how many times someone who's meditated for a few decades have, have repeated a mantra in whatever technique they, they're using. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes a vehicle of inward and outward development and support of nature as you're as you're saying yeah which also i mean if what we're saying here is is valid it also makes it clear that just sitting down picking any old meaningless sound is not going to have the same effect no in fact, when we were on our teacher training course, people were we were practicing how to teach people, and people were picking sounds like tugboat or something, and some people would actually begin to get physically sick <laughs> thinking a different sound like that. <laughs> well, I think uh, with mantra or in the, in the whole tradition of bhakti yoga, and I think there's more emphasis on devotional yoga in Amma's uh, path than possibly would be at least have been uh, articulated by Maharshi. And I do feel that as a person uh, grows in devotion towards some ideal, whether it's Devi or Krishna or, or whoever, Jesus, whoever, um, there's a scripture I came across, maybe an Upaveda scripture, that uh, said that devotion of a human being toward one of these higher beings is food for that being. It's like their nutrition. Mm. And you support the gods and they support That's them. right. And there's always in the Soma in the Sama Veda and Soma Mandala this this idea that yeah. that you're providing them with because devotion and love and human emotion, human feeling is what is their apple. Their, it's their yeah. rice and doll. You know, if I have this understood right, and that's also been verified by some personal experience that when I felt gratitude, great upliftment of, of feeling toward some divine being, I felt a very strong reciprocation, and it felt along the lines of, a gra of grace. Yeah, reciprocation is the key word here, because I've heard somebody critique that point and say, well, yeah, I believe in these these beings, but they're like energy vampires, you know, just sort of sucking your, no, living yeah. off your devotion. Yeah. But it's reciprocal, it's, you know. You probably receive more multiplied. than you give. Possibly multiplied. The reverse of that is that, you know, because a human, we talk about the human condition, uh, if you think about it, free will is a big part of our, and then there's the question of destiny, and, and, and that's always been the f philosophical question that people have grappled with, but the free will that we have to think and to feel, we can have our attention very high in, in, in an elevated place in terms of devotion or even ideal thought about the universe and how vast or whatever, or if we're a little bit stressed and irritated and, and discordant internally, we might turn that, you know, I really don't like that guy, and I really, and if I start to feel it strongly, to the level where I'm feeling anger and hatred and all those kind of things, which people don't feel generally day to day, but there are some who do. I think it's important that 
in my experience, I've noticed and I've observed that negative feeling, negative emotion, negative thought is also a type of nutrition for some level of creation. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, for instance, when they made that movie, The Exorcist, yeah. uh, there were all kinds of stories about really bad things happening, happening to, the, to people to on the, the set, the actors. And, and, yeah, working on the yeah. project, because you know, they were putting their attention and, uh, oh, yeah. uh, on this demonic stuff, and they were also preparing something which would give a big wave of right. demonic um, yeah. energy. In fact, uh, this fellow, <laughs> whom you would know, um, Andy Reimer. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I he was really <laughs> into that yeah, movie for some reason. Really? I, went, I went to visit him and, and our friend Rob Cox in one Chicago time in where? Chicago, yeah. and he made me watch that movie. <laughs> and I why? felt, uh, I don't why? know, he was into it. He thought it was some kind of like cosmic drama or something. Mm. And I felt so polluted yes. that I actually set up a puja table and did, did pujas for a while just to purify myself after watching it. Well, you know, you can walk into a room and there's been beautiful sentiment in that room, maybe a family reunion or something, and you and there are a lot, the people are gone, but you feel that love is still a re residue in the room. Yeah. Or you can walk into a room where some crime or murderous thing has happened um, in, in, in an odd place that you happen into, and suddenly you feel, I want to get out of here. Yeah. And it's very real. And well, it's... when my mother was in mental hospitals, I used to go and visit her, and I was a new meditator at that point, and, and whatever degree of, you know, awakening I had attained it was very fledgling and flimsy and and un, unintegrated and uh, yeah. unstable and I would go in there and I could just feel my whatever degree of coherence I had just breaking apart and even if I didn't I, I couldn't stay in there and visit with her because I would just get so uh, uh, now some people obviously work in those places and they've developed a uh, yeah some kind of ability to to function yeah. normally uh, but for me, I, w I was kind of wide open in a way and not stable in it, and I, I couldn't do it. Yeah, I remember, you know, even fear falls into that category. And in the world we live in today where terrorism, there's people have natural responses to, like, their children's safety. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never want to let that run, get, get a free reign within ourselves because uh, fear corrodes or kind of erodes the soul in my, in, in my observation. And mm -hmm. we want to... I think it's one of the great lessons that I'm still trying to uh, digest mm -hmm. and, and assimilate is discipline, not being hard-hearted, but disciplined enough in my, in my emotional day-to-day -day functioning as a coach, mm -hmm. not screaming at my kids, say, hey, you know, you can do this, you know, like the old football yeah. coaches. I let go of that a long time ago, but, but that was a lesson I learned in Asia, in the Tibetan community and the Nepalese community and in the Indian spiritual communities, that they are much, they are very much hard people. Yeah, yeah. But they are not as emotional people, if you can, if you can make the distinction. They are hard people, but they, they're uh, in in day to day situations. You would think, well, they don't show much emotion a lot of the time. Hmm. So, I think it's a lesson I was learning uh, in in India that coming from the West, my my focus was always what I was thinking, 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 and a transition occurred where I suddenly realized that, that no, I need to be much more in my heart. And I, after having a conversation with a Tibetan Lama up in this, uh, this district of Ladakh in northern India, mm -hmm. um, I took it to heart because he, he said, we don't even want to have the, sa the same thought twice. Mm. You know, it's like we pour the pitcher of water into the, into the teacup and we don't refill the pitcher. We just want to, we, we would rather, but that may be okay for contemplative lamas or monks, uh, for the rest of us who earn a living and pay, pay mortgages and so, so on. We, the mind is kind of thrown into activity, but at the same time, we would probably be spared a lot if we kept it in a very simple uh, manner that we didn't kind of keep running the same things through our heads so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, I have a friend who commented on Facebook recently that, she kind of like, um, I, I don't know if she just realized this or has, has known it for a while, but she, she doesn't really think, yeah. you know, and she's yeah. surprised that, that people think in such a verbal so way in their heads. So it's like she's kind of functioning from a pre-verbal level. In fact, there are levels of speech nice, in, in, the, yeah. in the Vedic thing, you know, Vaikari and Pashanti, Pashanti yeah. and Madhyama. Yes. And, yeah. and uh, so somehow she's at one of those subtler levels and just functioning from there without 
verbal uh, mental processing. I think that's a good candidate for describing what happens to these advanced um, artists and athletes and, and performers. Mm. You can't think your way through a, a, a triple toe loop thing in the, yeah, in the yeah. Olympic. You can't do it. You you have to have it. You you just leave the. If you start thinking in a tennis match, other than sensing and being alert, you're you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I'm sure a musician, you can't a pianist can't think. There's no way he can think his way through what he's doing. It's just. You know, yeah, I was watching this uh, Zakir Hussein tabla solo a while yeah. back, and um, he was just going blazing. A mile a minute. So fast. And I, I thought, what would it be like to be him doing yeah. that? And, and definitely he couldn't be functioning in any kind of a rational or no. logical or way in his mind to make his fingers and hands do what he's doing. It's got to just be coming from some deep intuitive level. That plus eight or plus ten. Plus huge plus training. Eight, eight or ten hours Ever since training. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His That's father all, used to wake him up in the middle of the night and make practice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful uh, in, a, in a way because it, it gives a training and that training has spills over into other areas of their life as well. Yeah. Okay, so we've kind of sketched out a lot of your subjective development. Um, I'm sure there's more to say about it, but I mean, one thing you just alluded to, which maybe you could elaborate on a bit more, is this kind of shift from head to heart. And that actually would lead us into some of the more outer stories, because yeah. that was um, facilitated by an encounter with a sage up yeah. in Jyotirmat yeah. in the Himalayas. The first time I really started thinking in terms of head and heart, not necessarily um, very clearly, but it was way back in 1974, and you and I were both in the French Alps, mm -hmm. and Maharshi came to our advanced uh, course, our advanced retreat, and he said, I'm going to give you all some advanced technique, some, some initiation, and I went into the room, and it was, I was only in there with him for about five minutes, and he, he said, now you need to follow your fine feeling level. And, I, and my thought, like, it jumped out of my head, well, what's that? Yeah. And he, and it was like the response to it was almost like he picked up on what I was thinking. And, and there was sort of a laser thread of light or something that, I, that kind of tickled my chest. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's it. Somehow it's being, I'm feeling it right now. And then he said, and this is, you can cultivate that. Or she said, by doing thus and such with the use of your mantra and meditation. Mm. So he elaborated on that, and that was my instruction. Then I was sent away uh, to do it. And that was sort of like uh, my attention of having my meditation process be more a mental technique. Mm -hmm. It had just shifted as a result of something Marshi had told me to being what I would call a more of a heart technique. Yeah. And that was began to culture something a little different inside of me at that point. Did it kind of stay shifted after that? It, no, not <laughs> not immediately, but because I would forget, and yeah. I've never been an intellectual person um, for whatever reason. But I, I, you know, realized that in, I was in college at the time. I had to do my schoolwork well, mm -hmm. and all that, and so I had to think clearly and I had to remember things and on whatnot. But it did make an impression, and I did when I would come to junction points in decisions in my life. I would mm -hmm. think, where do I want to make this decision from, up here or in here? Mm -hmm. And I at least gave 50% of my attention to what I felt about it. Because uh, I don't think in a, lot of, a lot of us in the Western world are, are taught to dis make decisions based on, uh, on feeling level as much as maybe other parts of the world. That's just a guess. Yeah. But anyway, I get to India, and this is some years later, after Marshi did this instruction in the French Alps in 1974, and, and literally almost two decades later, I get to India on this project again uh, from Maharishi's instruction. And uh, at that point, I met a, a sage or a saint uh, on a couple of different occasions there, three that I remember, and that really turned me 180 degrees around in, in how I viewed my life as a human being and the direction I wanted to take. And he, 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 I met him up in the Himalayas. He referred to himself as Keshava. And I wrote about him in a chapter in, in my memoir book, India Mirror of Truth. And he had this quality about him that I would only describe as ageless. He didn't seem to, you couldn't define, he could be 20, he could be 50, but he looked like he wasn't going to ever age. Mm. And 
he was mysterious. He was extremely comical guy, uh, but very simple and seemed to be a complete com control of, of every situation. Mm -hmm. And he, we talked very openly about spirituality. I told him at the time, you know, I'm aging fast. I'm 50 years old. I, I had a lot of gray hair. I was losing my hair. It's all gone now. Um, and he was laughing. He said, no, no, no. You know, he, he, age is like just a byproduct of a few negative thoughts you've had. That kind of, <laughs> I'm going, no, I don't think so. I said, you know, um, and he, he said, now try, here's some things I would like you to try. And he gave me three different instructions over the course of my encounters with him. The first one he referred to as continuous breathing. He said, you know, every human being breathes, but how many people are aware that they're breathing? It's involuntary. Uh, it just happens. But if you can add consciousness to your, your breathing, and you can do this, you're on a telephone, or he said, you can, anywhere you are in an airplane, if you can do this conscious breathing, you, will, you, you can breathe your way to enlightenment. Mm. And he said, you can reverse your aging. He is because it's the cells in your body and your brain that require this this prana and they get cut off from it through blocks of stress and so on and all the subtle physiology. He referred to the spine as the backbone of the person and the great uh, transmitter and receiver of all the cosmic knowledge that he seemed to have. He referred to the spine as that. And we know about it from various systems of yoga that, that may be true, kundalini yoga or whatever. So he said, breathe. That was the first thing. And do it effortlessly. Don't do it. It might be one way one day. It might be another way another day. So don't get too rigid about it. But it's a type of... So you do that even, do you do that even if you're playing tennis I do or something? It, and you're I do it. Not, not in a point, but in yeah. between points. In between I, points. I, you I, bring your attention back. When I'm teaching, I absolutely do it. Yeah. A, few, a few breaths. And when I started to learn more, I realized I, I, at one point I was reading a little bit about Kriya Yoga and Yogananda's tradition. And it seemed very much... Uh, in, in sync with uh, what he taught. And I know he taught more than one technique, but that Kriya Yoga, the, the, the breathing process, seemed to be very, very similar. So that was one thing. And the other thing that was on a more, maybe seemed to be more profound, was that Keshava said, you can close your eyes and you have meditated long enough now that you can <sighs> merge, was the term, with any divine being who you feel an affinity toward. Mm. Divine beings, we, I said, who, who are we talking about here? He said, Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, um, and some other names he mentioned, but those were the primary three. He said, if you, I said, okay, Krishna, I feel very Hindu. I'm living in India. I've been thinking, of reading Hindu books and reading Sanskrit stuff, scriptures. And so he said, okay, merge with Krishna. And he said, breathe. Krishna, into yourself through your heart, through your chest, and then feel the open expansion and keep doing it. And they said there's no, literally no limit to how wide you can expand. And he said, do it, but don't think of this as a formal initiation. Just enjoy it. You don't have to do it every day. You don't ever have to do it again. But he said, I, you, if you practice it, you'll get benefit from it. So those were the first two things he told me up in the Himalayas and in a, another encounter um, which would have to involve this comment of perception without the senses because it was not a physical we're having a physical conversation mm -hmm. this was more an internal vision type of thing he said it would be wonderful if you could keep your mantra going a mantra going 24 7 mm. I've never been able to do it I know mm -hmm. a couple of people who have been able to do it but I to, to think that I could do it during sleep or do it during my job, or doing while I'm eating, or whatever. That's still been. It, I heard Marshi say that once too. Actually, did he? And yeah, Dev in Marshi's Yeah, teaching. and it wasn't so much in, in, in that you would sort With of make key. an attempt to do it. It was more like it would become automatic. This right? is it. Would just be going on in you, the background. You nailed it, Rick. It, yeah. It's just on, it's on autopilot in a sense. Right. It's just in the background music in your mind, rather than thinking about a Beatles song. Yeah. <laughs> you just got. Oh, here comes I think the crystal. Here comes the up. sun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do, do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So those are the three things uh, spiritually that he thought could be of benefit to my, to my, uh, my life, to my evolution, to mm -hmm. my growth, and I've. Try to 
integrate them because you know Marshi had given some beautiful instructions for the spiritual path. Alma has given beautiful advice, and and I think that the uh, at one time Keisha was said you're you're far enough along you 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 can look at it as like you have a, a menu in mm-hmm. front of you. You don't ha- you've been doing the same thing for so many decades. Now I'm going to say to you if you're willing to accept this, have the menu, and one day maybe you'd like this thing from the menu, maybe one day chocolate cake, maybe one day apple pie. Mm. So don't feel like you, you have to do the same thing every single day of your life. You want to go into it and inspired and fresh, and I'm looking forward to my evening spiritual uh, sadhana, and take that approach. One day you might chant, one day you might breathe more, mm-hmm. and I have found that to be useful for me. Mm. I never feel that it's rote now or just I, I do this because... I have to do it or I'm letting somebody down. Or I'm... Of course, he was saying that to someone who was pretty well established. And, um, you know, perhaps a beginner wouldn't want to be such a dilettante. No. They'd, uh, yeah, they'd want to sort of stick are pit- to something. Yeah, there are, absolutely. That's a, it's a good point. There are pitfalls. To you. I think you want to establish yourself on the path and be consistent. Follow, you know, it's, gurus are there for a reason. They're, they're advice. They're sages. There's a reason why they're sages. They... Uh, if you can choose wisely, um, you should follow as best you can. And and there, I have never done what any guru figure has taught me to do perfectly, but I've tried. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. So um, we'll come back to Keshava in a minute. But I just, a thought popped into my head that for some reason I want to have you comment on, and it's completely a little bit out of the blue. But that is that. You know, we live in a community where a lot of people have been meditating for decades, and we also have frequented the Ama community, where people have been on the path for a long, long time. And you see some people who seem very happy and well-adjusted, and they're doing well. I see other people who their health is deteriorating, they, they, they seem mentally unbalanced, even crazy, mm-hmm. even though they've been meditating for ages. Uh, and you know, you wouldn't hold them up as examples, I mean, of, uh, you know, poster childs for, for the benefits of spiritual pursuit. Yeah. Do you have any insight or comment as to why there seems to be a fairly significant percentage of people like that? Well, let me step out of our immediate community and answer the question. I think I can because I was reading a book uh, about a Tibetan medical lama a mm-hmm. few uh, weeks ago, and actually when I was in San Diego on vacation just last week, it, it really was. And he was this very intuitive medical lama, and he was very young. And monks from around Asia would come to this Tibetan in in Lhasa, I think that's how in the capital of Tibet, Lhasa, yeah. Lhasa and they would come, and they they were having mental breakdown, or they yeah. were having. They were deranged, or they were frustrated, or they were, why am I angry? I've been doing this since I was 12 years old. I've been a monk, a monastic. And they were coming, and he would, and they would test this, this young medical lama and say, uh, tell us what's wrong with this guy. Mm-hmm. He's, this Japanese monk came, this Chinese monk came, and, and he'd say, well, that one, he's straining. Mm. He's just straining. He's not being natural. He's not listening to what his body's telling him. He's not... Um, living a balanced life. He's read every scripture known to man, but he hasn't di- digested, he hasn't integrated, and he's losing his, he's lost his mind because he hasn't assimilated what he's tried to do in his life. So he's, he's, there's been a fracture. This is exactly how he described it. And he's, this fracture is what's caused the mental instability. And, the, and so that was one guy. And then there was a, an Indian uh, uh, monk a sadhu who came, and he was quite arrogant. He was highly versed in the Vedas. And he said, all right, if you're so skilled, you tell me what's wrong with me. And he says, sir, I don't want to tell you because you won't like it. Mm-hmm. You'll be unhappy. He said, no, no, I'm here because I know if something's wrong with me, but I want to see if you can tell me what's wrong. He says, okay, your liver is like weeds are growing un- uncontrolled. He said, I don't know the name of this disease. And then his mentor, the senior lama, said, it's called cancer. Oh. And, and this book was written 30, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. He said, it's called cancer. He said, well, I don't want to tell him that because it'll only put his attention on it and it'll only get worse in his life. He said, no, no, he's asking you, so you have the freedom to tell him. Mm-hmm. And, and then, he, then the, the monks, the Indian sadhu says, well, why do I have that? He says, you get angry very fast. Mm-hmm. And that anger has calcified or, or 
metastasize or whatever, and it's mm -hmm. affected your emotions, and the emotions, one of the places they deposit themselves is in the liver. Mm -hmm. So bring it back to some of the situations, maybe we're talking closer to home here. People have grown up in Kali Yuga in the United States, and they, you know, you mentioned you'd had a rough, uh, you know, some rough situation with your, you know, your dad, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it it leaves its residue for people. And we, you know, we do dissolve a lot of the stress that comes into our life. And Amma hugs a person and she helps. And I think that's one of the reasons why sometimes people are, you know, sobbing because she's taken away something that's like been there forever. Yeah. Um, but these things can, the karma that's associated with those things, they they may accelerate, they may work themselves out, it may be on that level, but it may best just be being too rigid, thinking I have to do something and I'm going to do it, and even though I'd rather not do it, or someone has told me I have to do it every single day, and, and it's going against what your heart yearns to do, and that, if it metastasizes or becomes rigid, and that's one of the things that this young medical Lamy was highly intuitive, because he could, as he said, I could just see, I could see around the person what the issue was like lettering practically could, was telling me his body was saying I'm unhappy I'm angry you know my liver's stressed and I can only imagine that people are going through some of those kinds of experiences and I, I really don't know why mm. um, but if there if we could address ourselves and say you know am I feeling content am I feeling peaceful am I happy in my life then I think then things are probably um, going in the right direction, but if I feel like I'm doing this against my own will or something, that might be a problem. Um, I think fear is a factor in people's health. Um, I remember one astute comment that fear is a, a prayer we don't want answered. <laughs> and I think that there is some fear in people's lives that maybe I'm not going to achieve what I've do dedicated 40 years to achieving, mm -hmm. and maybe I won't get enlightened, and that would be unfortunate. But, you know, um, I think you'd have to look case by case. Yeah. And I do I do notice, you know, other, some people say, well, we live in a chemically infested part of Iowa where the crops are in the water and so on. Uh, I don't, I see healthy people here also. Yeah. Um, so those are a few possibilities. I, I do feel that, happiness and you know get out to I mean I felt so good getting out to the ocean getting in the ocean walking along the ocean you know that you see that ex unbounded Pacific Ocean there in San Diego and you just people had to smile on their face a lot out mm. there so yeah those are some yeah. yeah several things came to mind as you were speaking in addition to the things you said which are good um, and that you know diet I think hey. is a big deal and some people have very unbalanced diets um, maybe they're eating a lot of starches and sugars and yes. you know that stuff. Exercise. A lot of yes. people just sit on their butts a lot, yes. uh, meditating and looking yes. at their computers and don't get yes. adequate exercise. Yes. Another thing is um, kind of relationships and social interaction. Sometimes people are in lifestyles where they um, can get very idiosyncratic and there's no one to call them on their stuff. Yes. Um, and if you get into marriage or some close relationship, there's definitely someone to call you on your stuff. Yes. And it was a bit of a shock for me when I first got married because I was like j j straight off this monastic program yeah, that yeah. had been on for a long time. And, uh, and so was Irene. Um, but I'm grateful for that. And, be, and I see old friends who are on that program who are having a hard time, some of them. You know, there have been some suicides. There have been some pe mental breakdowns. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I know these guys. They were brilliant. They had deep experiences. But... There was never any kind, and they don't have the close personal interaction with a master where the master is going to keep, you know, whacking yeah. you with a stick if yeah. necessary. Yeah. And so they're able to go off on tangents and yeah. get farther and farther and farther off with no checks and balances. Yeah. And next thing you know, those are serious. Problem. Yeah. There's that old Vedic analogy. You get in the ashram and all these rocks are put into the tumbler and they've got edges. And then... Yeah. The guru starts spinning the tumbler, just like the rocks on the beach in, in the Pacific coast. They're all smooth, smooth and yeah. round and beautiful. And my wife is trying to bring them all back in my suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> like, suitcase weighed an extra, you know. So that tumbler effect is there. And sometimes when the rough edges are getting smooth, um, it, it can be rough for people. There, there was a... a uh, a sadhu, a reclusive sadhu, I met up in a place called Gangotri, which is 
translates as the source of the Ganges at about 10,500 feet in the Himalaya. And honestly, I've met him for the most strange reason possible. Someone, I, I was up there and I was trying to find a, a Times of India. Well, why am I looking for that? I'm not going to even say why, but they said this, there's a guy up there in, the, in a cave named, um, I can't think of his name right now. Anyway, go up there, knock on his door. And he'll have today's or yesterday's times of India. And I, how? And he said, well, he gets them. So I went up there and I got to the wrong cave. Mm -hmm. And the guy next to it was sitting outside with a big smile on his face. And I, I said, do you have the times of India? <laughs> and he goes, he's, he goes like this. He, he points to the cave next door. But then he picks up a paper and pen and he writes, I am in silence and I don't speak. And I haven't spoken for many years, but I'd be happy to write a message back to you if you have any question. Mm. And I said, uh, th this fellow's name was uh, Swami Raman uh, Parnantirt was his name. And I said, sure, I have a question. Do you want me to write it too? Do you want to not hear my words? He said, no, you can speak. And he wrote this in, uh, down and he said, and I'll answer by paper. And so he started out by asking me a question. He says, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Well, at the times of India. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Very good. I, and he, we were laughing. He had sunglasses on. He was sitting out in the bright sun and, and about 35 years old, strong arms, broad shoulders. And I said, I'm part of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi's group and, and I'm teaching meditation in India for the past so many years to corporate types. He gets his paper and he says, is Maharshi University still in California? Mm. And I thought, well, you know, because it, it started out there, you know that. Right. It started out in Santa Barbara moved to, to here in Fairfield, Iowa in 1974-ish, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's not there anymore. And then we kind of struck up this dialogue and we went on and he started uh, sharing things with me and I shared things with him. And I mentioned him because when I ultimately got to the next cave uh, where the guy had the Times of India, he said, oh, you probably got sent here by uh, Swami Paranand Tirt. And I said, yes, yeah, yeah. How, how would you know? He says, well, we're neighbors. I know him very well. And um, I come here for the summers. He's been here seven years without leaving. But Paranand tried to do a shortcut to enlightenment and it backfired. And he ended up two times in the hospital in, in Uttarkashi. Oh. It, you know, it basically caused a huge uh, internal explosion of some sort. And I don't know the details of what he was trying to do, mm. but I do know that sometimes people uh, want to get to the goal so badly that they abandon the middle way and they make it, you know, in, intensity is a good thing to a threshold, but if we push it too far, that I think is, crack. I think things crack, can crack. Yeah, yeah. And the guy next door who was from Rajasthan, he said he's been down there twice and he's tried to use these, a yogic techniques. Uh, he has a guru, but his guru is so old. He lives in Uttarkashi. He very rarely sees him. He's three hours away. And so he's kind of doing things on his own without the guidance. The silence guy. The silence guy was. Uh -huh. So he was doing things on his own. And if you read the value of the guru and, and what you, sh you know, techniques and, and some, because some are very powerful, especially if you get into these techniques that wake up the subtle, powerful Shakti inside. And I think that's what he had done. And it, it kind of ran rampant for a bit. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that came to and my And other mind. things can do that too. I mean, like intensive pranayama, if you do too much of it, there's all kinds of things that can drive you crazy if you don't do it, literally, if you don't do it right. And could you mention diet? Yeah. He was living off of seeds and, and grain and powdered milk. Mm. He, had, he was part of a sannyasi uh, sect that does not cook food. Mm -hmm. That's a vow they take. Right. So he, he had a fire, but that fire could keep him warm and it, you know, he could... The sadhus say if you meditate by a fire, the mantra value of the repetition, repetition uh, Agni is considered the communicator to the gods in the Vedic tradition. So if you, if you meditate by a fire or even a river, it's more potent hmm. than meditating in your bedroom. So mm -hmm. that was his... He had fire, but he, and maybe his diet was imbalanced. And he, the winters up in that area are very severe. Oh, yeah. And he's all alone, and he doesn't speak. Wow. So Interesting. he was trying. So safety first. I would say. Yeah, that was Marshy's master's motto, safety first. Yeah. Um, and I know that Joan Harrigan in their Kundalini Care Institute in Tennessee has, you know, well, and others, Bonnie Greenwell, whom I'm going to be interviewing in a month in, on the 20th of 
October, I uh, have encountered many people who have had deflected yeah. risings of Kundalini and have gotten stuck or even in kind of serious problems. Yeah. I remember Marshi one time say, okay, you're in this boat and we're, we're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Stay in the middle of the boat. He yeah. said, don't lag in the back of the boat and don't try to get at the front of the boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stay, you know, and well, uh, to be honest, when I got to India, I, I thought, I want to be in the front of the boat. I want to just, you know, get going. And I, you know, I honestly pushed it to my limit. And in May, I don't say I ever regretted a moment, but I do know that there were times when I thought, well, okay, I got to hold on with both hands. I need to buckle the seatbelt right now because yeah. with these Kali experiences, there was kind of really free-flowing uh, inner experiences. And I kind of realized I got to, you know, throttle back a tad. Yeah. I remember the first time we were told we were going to India, um, I was... Uh, I was. Uh, they said, "Yes, you're going to India, and it's going to be intense." And a friend of mine, Larry Geisler, said, "Oh boy, intense! Yeah, it's going to be really intense." It turns out we were in tents in, <laughs> in, 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 in British Army tents, right? Right, something like that. That's great. On these little cots. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get back to Keshava. Sure. Um, he comes up in both of your books. Um, yes. Yes. Kind of like. Explicitly in, in your, your first book. In the right? memoir, he's referred to as Keshava. In in the novel, he's referred to as Yogi Raj. Right. Both similar, same personality, ageless, could be a thousand years old, a few centuries. Who could say? Yeah. And who could verify? And uh, I couldn't. Um, but when I met him, um, or you had a question about Keshava before we... Well, um, you believe that Keshava is Babaji, who is spoken of in Yogananda's book and... Um, Sri M, whom I've interviewed a couple of times, has met him, and uh, he's this sort of, Yogananda presents him as this sort of immort, immortal yogi and who lives in the Himalayas and sort of shows up from time to time and intercedes in, in people's lives. And um, the three times you met him, I believe he appeared in different form each time, but nonetheless you felt it was the same being because he has this sort of shape-shifting ability, apparently. And I... I want to say he never referred to himself as Babaji. Right, just your assumption. Right, right. My assumption. The and uh, we can let a listener or an audience kind of make their formulate their own opinion. I'm perfectly happy with that, and I'll tell uh, a story of my second uh, my meeting in a different place. I, mm -hmm. I talked about the things he taught me <clears throat> when I went to Marshi's uh, services, memorial services in 2008. They were in 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 Prayag, about three hours drive from Varanasi or Banaras. Uh, some people call it Shiva's city, maybe the oldest city in the world, the holiest city in India generally, and many, many, many thousands of Indians at the time that they're uh, ready to pass uh, pass away, they go to Varanasi to to do that and then have their ashes sprinkled on the Ganges. Yeah. That's considered a, a lifetime wish for many people. What if you go there and you don't die? Uh, you know, <laughs> like, like the little big man, you know, where he gets up on the face, it's a good day to die, and then he it starts die. to rain, and he, he, starts, yeah. he wakes up, and he's, well, I'm not going to die today after all. <laughs> I'm sure there are people who have been living there for years. <laughs> Waiting to die. To die. I don't, don't, and I've seen many of them, and I've seen many corpses, uh, you know, being incinerated, and I've seen, you know, yeah. all the different, it's quite a... a it's an industry. It's a... <laughs> Shocking experience the first time. Yeah. It's also a very powerful one in mm -hmm. a positive way. Okay, go ahead. So we were done with the memorial services, and there had been a, a Swami there who was very highly respected, who had come to visit and pay respects to Maharshi. He had an ashram at the Manakarnika Burning Ghats in Varanasi, which I had heard about, and I had met him at some time in my travels, and I wanted to pay and thank him because I, I didn't get a chance to see him at, at the memorial services, but I wanted I was so close, I wanted to say hello and, and greet him. So I was making my way with a friend, Will Fox, into the, the Monacarnica, Monacarnica Gat area, and I think they have 100 cremations a day there, so it's a big operation. I couldn't find his ashram, and, I, and suddenly, out of nowhere, this extremely handsome or beautiful teenage boy appears in front of me and I said, do you know where, I asked him, I said, do you know where Swami Satya Baba lives, his ashram? And he says, he says, no, 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 I'll take you where you want to go. And this boy was not only striking, uh, maybe 14 years old, maybe 15, it's hard to tell, but he was dressed immaculately in a beautiful silk uh, kurta and, and dhoti and all. He looked just spectacular, as I remember him, and he was with three or four or five other boys about his age who were 
uh, kind of his buddies, his cohorts. And I said, no, I'm going to see Swami Satyabha. I have this fruit with me. And he said, no, no, I'm going to, I'll take you where you want to go. He repeated it. And I said, well, where is that? He said, follow me. Mm-hmm. So we start off down up upstream, actually, up the, up the ghats. There are multiple ghats, burning ghats, as you go along. And there are ashrams on the hill, and there are temples, and all those things are there as it was very near, actually, where, where some of Maharshi's ashes were deposited in the river and is also where his guru had been put into the river uh, uh, in a, what they call Jal Samadhi, water burial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're going past this 10, 15 minutes walking and walking, and there are all these huge stone steps that go down, and some of it's concrete, but it's just this massive scene at 9 p.m. at, at night. Uh, you hear temple bells, and you hear people chanting, and it's just surreal. It's sort of like you're by the river Styx in the Greek uh, mythology or something, and you're just walking along, and suddenly he says, we're going up there now, and so we turn, and we're climbing these steps, and we go up to the bluff, which is where most of Varanasi is up above the river, and you look down onto the river, and we're up on this bluff, and now we're in these awful, smelly alleyways that have no lights, no street lights, you know, street dogs running around sniffing and you and you just thinking this is the worst this is the worst thing that could possibly have happened what's going to happen next and i'm thinking bad things could happen because bad things do often sometimes happen to westerners who are a little uh, naive or unsuspecting and not not careful it's nighttime you usually don't just go up alleys like that in varanasi you could, could get robbed so he says the boy this beautiful sadhu boy says you should go into that at the end of this one alleyway. He says, you, you should go in there. And in there meant through a gate into a two, three-story building that looked fairly old. And that's where you want to go. And I said, really? And I had no idea where we were. And we're in the middle of you know these alleys. And there was no sign in the front. So he, I said, really, inside, he says, I'll take you. And so he let us in. Will was with me. And we went inside. And he said, you should go around that edge of that wall, there's a little partition, a concrete wall there, and you go in there and sit down and meditate. That's where you want to go. So he said, just go. And so we went in there, and around the corner of this wall was a life-size statue of Maha Avatar Babaji. Mm-hmm. I mean, he might have been five feet if he were standing tall, according to the way, the, the way he looked. And he looked the way he did in Yogananda's book. His hair was pulled back, and it was, I don't know what kind of... Um, how it was made. It wasn't granite, but I, I don't know. Behind him was a mural of planet Earth. And before sitting down to meditate, like the, the, the boy had instructed us, I went back and I said, can I give you some rupees? This is really fascinating because I, I feel like I know you know this situation here. He said, no, 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 I don't want your rupees. And he kind of blew it off and kind of rolled his eyes. Like, <laughs> you silly guy. you know. And it wasn't disrespectful, but I, I got it. He was kind of humorous about it. Like, oh, here we go, you know, these these guys. So I, he said, you go and meditate. And we and Will and I went and meditated there, and we had literally some of the best experience I could ever remember in 40 years. Uh, and then when we got done, after an hour or so, we got up, and he, the boys were long gone. Never saw him again, never asked him his name, never knew who, was, who his buddies were. But we kept, we stayed there for another four or five days, not you know, in that building, but we were staying in a hotel and we came back two or three more times. And the second time we came back was to meditate again. And this time there was a lady in there, very friendly lady, about 45, 50 at the most. And she said, can I be of some help? And I said, yeah, we we were led here a day or two ago by some gorgeous little beautiful boy and his friends. And we were told to meditate by the uh, by the statue of Babaji. And by the way, there were two other shrines there. And one was an, a shrine to Lahiri Mahasaya, Babaji's disciple, who was Yogananda's great guru. And another shrine that had a big, big clot of dirt, which said underneath it in English, dirt taken from Babaji's cave in the Himalayas. Hmm. So I said, well, where are we? Because I didn't know that, you know, the boy didn't tell us. He just said, this is where you should meditate. And there's some connection to Baba. He said, she said, I'll tell you, I am the great, great, grand, grand niece of Lahiri Mahasaya. Mm. And this was his ancestral home mm. upstairs. And down here was more of ashram. Mm-hmm. I said, really? So Lahiri Mahasaya, the disciple of Babaji. And mm. She said, yes. And if you want to go upstairs, you can sit in the room where he meditated. It was, And we did. And there were his... Paducah sandals, the wooden sandals with 
that that's pegs. yeah the pegs and other personal effects of his and the this, this maybe a tiger skin that he met it, I don't know there's some skin there and there were scriptures that were old is sort of really cool and she said you're welcome to meditate here for a few minutes or sit here if you'd like and and she said if there's anything we can do we'll sh we'd be happy you know to to assist you and then she left mm -hmm. and so I thought that was very interesting and she said by the way you know I have cousins and uncles that are are swamis and gurus in Europe and and so on and and so the tradition uh, within our family has been carried on and um, I just happen to be a relative of, of Lahiri Mahasaya. Hmm. So that was added a little bit more recognition to what was going on here. Um, and as, you know, if you re remember your autobiography of Yogi, you remember that Lahiri uh, met Babaji in Raniket in the Himalayas where he had been moved in his job position by some help from Babaji and he, and he met Babaji, got some instruction up there and, hmm. and, and then went from there. Cool. So that was the other encounter, and there was no transfer of knowledge, it was just this just experience of meditate yeah. here, this is where you want to be. I thought that was an interesting, because he was... Was there a third encounter? Yes, and that in third encounter was, again, not in a physical... There were a couple, three encounters in succession in, in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. and I called those one encounter, and then there was this encounter in Varanasi, and the third encounter was... Uh, perception without this senses type of encounter, which you could go into or not go into. Yeah. If you feel significant. Oh, there's, otherwise, there's other things um, we can talk about. He appeared... He, he, he's such a mischievous personality. He appeared as a cat. <laughs> so, um, not the whole time, but, you know, a talking cat. It was very, you know... But, like yeah, well, okay. And then when he yeah. left the session, he, on a surfboard, he surfed right out of the room. Huh. So, All right, people, keep watching. We'll, yeah, we'll get past some, this spot. I told you, I didn't force it on you. <laughs> I'm having my moment. You know, I didn't want I'm not forcing it on you. And, and, Steve's blushing. Yeah, I'm blushing. And I, I qualified it by saying it was perception without the senses, so it could be, could be who in, knows where. Yeah. But I have some trust in my, you know, my inner, you know, inner eye, my inner mm -hmm. you know, mind's eye, if you want, whatever you want to call it, third eye. And that was one of them. Hmm. Interesting. So... <laughs> Well, I like cats. Um. <laughs> yeah, that would bring us, could bring us around to a discussion of uh, a perfected siddha, those beings in the, in the world who have the ability to morph. Uh, shape shift is one term that's kind of used in popular Hollywood movies where these superhero comic characters yeah. become super strong, super big. Ant Man, I don't know who they are. Yeah, a whole bunch I used of them. to take them, my tennis team, to see those movies because that's what they wanted to see when we go to the state tournament, so they yeah. could relax at a movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw that they were these guys were heroic and they were uh, able to change form. Well, I think that that might be an analogy for some of the things that it may even come from a tradition of the yogic tradition in India, where uh, certain. Enlight highly enlightened individuals can perform those. Yeah, special, I mean, there's all kinds of stories like that, beans. and yeah. f from the yoga tradition of India, uh, shamans in South America, Absolutely. Carlos Castaneda, and there's all the different cultures have these stories. One of the cool things when we were up in Tibet again, it was me and Will, Will Fox, where we were there, and we said, "Where are the really deep Lama?" Uh, monasteries because we went to the monastery that supposedly had the records of Jesus coming to Tibet and, and to India and they Hemus. We went to another one called Lama Yuru where there were half a dozen uh, places where Lamas would go underneath and they would stay for three years at a time without light. They just get one meal a day and yeah. if they didn't eat for two weeks then they broke down the wall and figured the guy had Died. left his body. Yeah. So these are pretty heavy duty kind of places but the, they said the real place was beyond this range of mountains this, that they pointed to and they said in the winter when no one can get there that's when they practice levitation huh. in the summer they come out and they fundraise and they, they work with the community and they, and they do pujas they don't want people to see them apparently hmm. uh, but you know in the winters I don't, can't even imagine the foot the, the, the snow is as high as the roof yeah. and if you haven't dug a, tra a trail you don't go anywhere yeah, a friend of ours named Craig Pearson wrote a book about levitation. He just, he collected all the accounts of it uh, from around the world um, in different cultures and everything. There certainly are a lot of accounts. I mean, yeah. you know, 
I've never seen it, um, and you and I have been, you know, for years we've practiced the TM City program with a couple thousand people who are yeah. all trying to do it, and I never saw an example mm -hmm. of it, but, um, and there's all kinds of explanations as to why that never happened, but um, personally, I mean, people can yeah. think what they want. Uh, personally, I think probably some of these accounts are true, that it's, it's, it's possible, and it's interesting because it suggests that um, the human relationship to the laws of nature, such as gravity, is very different than we might think. And that sort of suggests that, you know, consciousness is so fundamental, not just a product of the brain, but so fundamental that if you can really learn to function uh, at a deep enough level and you can master certain laws of nature that reside there and create all kinds of effects. My better experiences of kind of the the liquid light filling up and kind of propelling me or freeing me to kind of um, go places that didn't feel like Fairfield, Iowa. <laughs> um, the subjective sensation was, I'm free. I could do anything. Obviously, I couldn't do anything, otherwise I would have done it. Yeah. I would have said, I'd pop in on Rick and say, hey, I've, I'm going to win Wimbledon next week. Yeah. But the conviction, and maybe this is where people get kind of fritzed out, but the conviction and sensation that in this um, octave of vibration that I referred to earlier, that, that's not a visible to my eye, but was visible to me in that inner state, <clears throat> it was so liberating and so freeing that I felt like, you know, when I go back into, you know, the six-foot body, I feel like I'm in a prison. Yeah. And, um, that's not a negative comment on being in a physical body because there's because we all chose to do it and there's so much that we can get from it so i'm happy sure. i want to perpetuate it but but the freedom i felt in in that state maybe i was just delusional but i just felt like oh i could pretty much do anything yeah we're just i just became aware of someone who um has deeply studied patanjali and also Carl Jung, and as an expert in sort of juxtaposing their perspectives, I think I'm going to be interviewing her a little bit while down the line. But I mentioned Patanjali because the third yeah. chapter of the Yoga Sutras is all about cities. Um, and, you know, most teachers and people dismiss cities as an distraction or, a, you know, a, a, a tr kind of a hang a side show. on your side show. Uh, but then why did he devote three, uh, a, chap a whole chapter of a four-chapter book to, uh, to explaining how to do them? <laughs> if well, I believe they're deep practices, and I believe that the, the tangible results are not the main show. I think that the, the process learning, of mastering them. Yeah, learning to function at the deep levels of consciousness would be valuable. Yeah, right. Because obviously, you know, an elephant is as strong as an elephant. That's one of Patanjali's sutras. So, uh, or a, a crow can fly. So it's not the, the ability to do those things that's significant, it, but the, the, the sort of uh, development that acquiring the ability to do those things uh, would be kind of a real interesting... And even having, if someone had developed them, Akeshava has discussed this in, in conversations with me, that if, because he... From to my mind, he he had those abilities, mm -hmm. and he said, once one has mastered those abilities, there are only a few circumstances where you would use it. Yeah. You would never use it to control another person ever. The d consequences would be dire. Right. And if you were to get hold of some of those powers without the big picture, yeah. could be dire. Yeah, I think there are people who become black magicians yeah. and so on. And if you if you on the other hand have Develop the full perfection of your human nervous system. I've seen Ama do things. I've seen Marshi do things that, you know, you and I just can't do. Right. Um, Superhumans type stuff. And if they are doing it with the intention of helping someone else in the right context with that person or helping the world or seeing a, a, a potential catastrophic situation in the world and Ama addresses it many times that you know these dark clouds are gathering mm -hmm. children and let's intensify our prayer or this or meditation or you know she's seeing something in the future which is a city in itself and mm -hmm. then she's saying we need to avert it and yeah. so those kinds of things are proper uses of, of Patanjali's uh, he probably addresses it somewhere in his, his treatment yeah, too I, he probably does I imagine 
I interviewed Dana Sawyer um, a couple of times, who has been to India 20 times and speaks fluent Hindi and everything. And I, I was asking about cities and whether you know he had seen any of all his, all his time in India. He said, I never did. I mean, he said, I knew all the tricks. I mean, you can take a, a walnut and put it in your armpit and cause your pulse to stop and, and claim, claim that your heart has stopped. And you can you know conceal a sponge in your hair and squeeze it and, and have milk flow down and, oh, and things like that. He knew all these tricks. And he, he called people on it, these fakers. But he said, I saw one guy who was actually able to swallow a live snake and then regurgitate it. He said, that was the most amazing thing I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try this at home. Yeah. Um, so, before we get too goofy here, um, so, so we we talked earlier about enlightenment and whether it's there is such a, I mean whether such a term is even meaningful because it implies some kind of an endpoint. Um, and you know, you mentioned in your notes that some spiritual authorities consider enlightenment to be the beginning rather than the goal of human evolution. So. Um, and, and there are many people, many masters, teachers, gurus in this world who were supposedly enlightened, who did things which didn't seem very enlightened, and that's caused a lot of confusion with, for, in people. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that, um, you know, why so many gurus seem to screw up, and what, you know, whether enlightenment really is sort of an end point or actually a beginning point to higher levels of potential development. Well, there's a, there's a term used in Vedic parlance called Lesha Vidya, mm -hmm. which I believe translates as the faint remains of ignorance. Yeah. And that it's my understanding that uh, the faint remains of ignorance remain even in a highly enlightened individual. Mm -hmm. um, and it's said that without such faint remains, you wouldn't even be able to function because yeah. you need to Some sort of stay yeah. grounded on the earth to a certain extent. You need to be able to distinguish between yeah. a door and a wall and, right. you know, things like that. One of the fun lectures I ever heard was an advanced lecture by a friend of mine named Jeff Tepper. And he, this is down in Tucson, Arizona, right in the heart of the Saguaro National Desert. And he said, you know, if you're in UNID consciousness, folks, you're not going to go out in the desert and hug a saguaro cactus. <laughs> <laughs> so you might see right. everything as one, but the practical differentiation of that's still a cactus and it can really rip you up if you do the wrong, you don't walk in front of a bus. Right. So the boundaries need to be there and, and they serve a purpose and that Lesha Vidya yeah. is that function. Now those are practical examples yes. of why it would be good to still perceive duality even though duality might not ultimately be the, the reality. But then, then you have, you know, gurus getting involved with sexual escapades and money issues and all kinds of strange things that don't be, Yeah, um, I'm certainly not qualified to, to address that very well other than that it, you know it's chronicled in, in Tibetan tradition and the yogic tradition and in yogis that we've read and, and, and admire um, and gurus. Um, the, the part of the Lesha Vidya that comes along with being a human being is something called parabdha karma mm -hmm. and that is the suitcase in theory we all have mountains himalayan mountains of karma kind of behind us and, and we can't take on take it all on in in this incarnation but we carry a suitcase of of samples of that karma maybe i didn't learn something very fundamental with how to interact with my mother or my uh, my wife whatever it might be or or Women, I, I mistreated uh, a woman in my past life, or I was a woman, I mistreated my husband in the past life. Well, that karma, I may have to sort it out in this life, and I come in with that suitcase of karma. When we all do, the possible exceptions might be those few that we could call divine incarnations, and I don't know, you know, whether... I heard so many amazing stories about Amma, and her, even you know, as a as an infant, mm -hmm. you know, sitting on her mother's hands and you know, like meditation type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, can't know other than the stories, but um, the average Jivan Mukta goes from ignorance when he or she is born and grows into enlightenment and working out the karma. And that suitcase of karma may perpetuate itself a little bit even beyond the stage where they're fully enlightened, and. That could be an answer. Maybe, uh, as people have said, Buddha 
just walked away from his wife and family at some point. Yeah. How does that? Well, they were well taken care of. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, he and, and, he, and he loved them. And they became his disciples, or at least yes. his wife did later yes. on. So it's not like he was going out to womanize. No. He, he, no. he left for a reason, and he dedicated himself yes. to something. So, um, um, yeah, and Ramana stole his brother's yeah, school Kri money Krishna in order was to get the down the Tiruvannam Malai. Yeah. Krishna was the butter thief, a thief, and his mother kept saying, you can't keep going to auntie's house and taking, you know, the butter is very cherished thing. They make ghee and they cook with it, and they kept stealing taking it and stealing it and, and taking it for his friends and the cows mm -hmm. in the field out in the forest and in Vrindavan. So all these are lures and legends, but um, that's kind of beyond my... Well, also, I mean, even in the... In the Mahabharata, for instance, there's stories of Krishna, who was supposedly an avatar, um, kind of cheating, you know, as yeah. telling Arjuna to hit Dury break Duryodhana's leg, hit, hit him below the belt, yeah. or, you know, lie, tell, telling, I think it was Yudhishthira, to lie about who he had just killed. He said, Gatotkacha, the elephant, Gatotkacha, the elephant, is dead. And Gatotkacha is also the name of the son of... Because yeah, yeah, so, there are all these ethics in those so days. So he told the white lie, and his chariot wheels sunk in the mud. So, all, so all those uh, ethics about Vedic warfare, which you you don't fight after dark, and all these things you don't do, and and these are quote underhanded things. They were yeah, they yeah. were tricks. Well, I think mistakes can be made, and I, I remember hearing a story, uh, not hearing the story, hearing Marshi tell the story, that he made a, a substantial mistake when he was a young um, brahmachari who had been out of the Himalayas for some years because uh, Indira Gandhi was, what, prime minister around 1980? Is that when she started? Somewhere in there. Yeah. And so he'd been out for some time, but he, the story he told was that it was a mistake on his part that he was sitting in, an, in a room when she was coming in to, to be received with an audience. Everyone in India it would stand up for the prime minister. Marshi said, I couldn't make myself stand. Mm. I just didn't stand. And he said... It was taken note of by not only her, but her psychophants, how do you pronounce that? Psychophants. psychophants and all the people around her. And the way I understand is that the Congress party, which she ruled for a long time, and then her son Rajiv ruled, and then her son's wife, Sonia, mm. was the head of the Congress party, and on and on. For This went on for 30 years. It always created problems for him because of that one initial yeah. incident. He did some other things too that might be construed as mistakes. Well, but I guess the, the deeper question, the broader question is um, is there a tight correlation between higher states of consciousness or the highest state of consciousness? And moral decision making that, that a human and all that? can. Yeah. yeah, and um, you know the and ethical behavior, and some say no, no, none whatsoever. You can be a um, you know enlightened axe murderer or something. Uh, other <laughs> others say yeah, there's a correlation, but it's loose. And I I bring it up f too often for some people's tastes, just because there's so many examples of it. In fact, I'm I've been involved well, in helping to establish the Association of Professional Spiritual Teachers, and that will be a presenting that at the Sand Conference, which has a code of ethics such as the AMA or the American Psychological Association would have that teachers could perhaps aspire to and that students could take as an example of what to expect in a teacher. Well, I would say one general thing, you know, because we I don't know if we're kind of uncles at this point to to younger spiritual, but we've been around the block at least. I mean, I learned maybe. I learned meditation as a teenager, you yeah. know, and all that and I'm sure you you did the same and became uh, a, a teacher of meditation as a teenager and um I would say don't be in a hurry, you know, go, and, and even our grand guru, Swami Brahmanan Saraswati, he, what did he do? He searched for three, four years, did he not? He left home at the age of eight or nine, and, you know, it was about five years traveling up the Ganges until he, he found a master. he interviewed. Yeah, he interviewed. He had three, several requirements that he wanted to be, were non-negotiable for him, and so right. he took his time. Finding a teacher that met them. Met someone who met their criterion, and I, I think that would be... Uh, some advice I would give that that there are many many people um, in India and other parts of the world who would consider themselves guru and are are venerated as gurus. Um, not necessarily people that I would look to in that role, but um, um, I also feel that there are highly highly qualified people, and I would certainly put uh, Ama in that group of. I, I have yet to um, find that her practical knowledge and her example uh, of a of an of a saint they they've really been impressive yeah so. all right well we won't dwell on this point too much longer um perhaps just to say that 
if we, you know, people have a tendency to see their guru as perfect and divine and, and totally enlightened and all that. And, um, you know, it's good to respect your teacher and to even feel devotion for your teacher. But um, one should never abdicate one's own judgment and discrimination. And even the Buddha said that. He said, you know, don't believe something just because I said it. You know, you have to sort of figure it out on your own. and make. So if you see somebody doing something and you, and you think, well, it seems wrong to me, but they, they, they're so highly evolved, what do I know? That's not the right way to look at it. Jesus said it many times in different ways, beautiful phrases, you know, um, trust your higher uh, self. That's a paraphrase for mm-hmm. how he would have phrased it. But mm-hmm. I think... Divine wisdom is what we're all after, divine experience, divine consciousness, uh, a divine permanency about our life that, that we we're sort of, I think it's in the DNA that, mm-hmm. that at a certain stage, it, that DNA gets activated and we start, you know, we first we read about it. First I read Siddhartha, you read Siddhartha, then we start poking around, maybe we get off the track, oh, marijuana, maybe that'll provide the answer and maybe this will provide the answer. And then, but but waking up, just that that understanding that there is a higher state, that's a awakening in itself. And then the next step is to actually taste the fruits of, mm-hmm. of consciousness growing, and then seeing the benchmarks that some senior people have written about in the past, Ramakrishna or whoever, or, or scriptures um, have been elucidate this sort of thing. And then hopefully we can find it and yeah. and and tap into it and and trust. Truly trusting your own inner wisdom and your high, and the higher self that is there to guide us. Um, I've said this many times, in different contexts. That it's my experience that that there is a uh, a quality of higher self that moves with us from incarnation to incarnation, and it doesn't really get down in the mud. We're down in the mud finding our way, but it sort of it. We could go through many incarnations, hundreds, and not even know that there's such a thing that would guide us consciously but it may still be guiding us subconsciously or in in a dream or in some other way and that when we start to get to a state of full awakening a full realization we are getting closer to that uh perfect template that that resides in in us above us where we don't need to talk in terms Mm -hmm. of spatial relationships but but we start to become one with it Mm -hmm. and um, that's when I think the, the game of evolution really gets interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th- there was a charming, wonderful woman named Peace Pilgrim who, yeah. you know, no Peace Pilgrim, who wandered around the United States with nothing but the you know, clothes on her, on her body uh, and just totally relied upon the kindness of strangers to subsist for a long time, wore, wore a t-shirt or a sweatshirt that said Peace Pilgrim. Anyway, she, in her little book, which is beautiful, she, she talks about how at a certain stage, you know, there's a degree of awakening where the individuality is pretty much out of the way and not, you know, interfering or trying to conduct the process of evolution. And she said then it really takes off, you know, because you, as long as, you know, our limited human efforts are trying to orchestrate uh, that, it's it, we're kind of like handicapping God in a way. <laughs> Sometimes two steps forward, one back, and all. Yeah. Well, Marshy did make a comment one time that evolution really begins in cosmic consciousness. I do remember That's that basically what she was saying. that phrase. Yeah. Speaking of what is kind of wandering around and letting nature provide for you, I, I had a I think it's a fun encounter in South India mm-hmm. once upon a time. This was in 1982. It was on a, another project prior to this uh, teaching to corporate executives uh, that came later. And we were directed by some German friends, you must go to Kanyakumari, which is a very holy little temple at the very southern tip of the subcontinent, where the three seas meet, the Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, and Bay of Bengal all converge there. This is a Devi temple there. It's a very holy place uh, to a certain aspect of the young girl aspect of the Divine Mother, unmarried uh, virgin aspect. Living next to the temple was this Avadut. An Avadut is a, 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 a yogini. She was a yogini who doesn't ever cook or provide for herself or anything. She, whatever someone hands you or if, she, ever, if an insect crawls along, she might make that might be her meal. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. But yeah. she, she was famous. She was venerated. People would come to see her. Saints would come from the Himalayas to see her, we were told. 
And we were also told by the local fishing community, Kanyakumari is a fishing community, that she was frequently seen floating on driftwood out in the ocean when the tides would go out. And she looked ancient. She had skin was totally leathery. She had just a little bit of cloth uh, for her attire. And when we were there, she was there. She wasn't out floating in the ocean. And we were told to bring bunches of bananas. Yeah. So we came with these bunches of bananas. And as we came, dogs started to come. Like 20, 30 dogs started to kind of hang out there because we found out later why. So she came out. Didn't speak, but she looked ancient. We were told she was centuries old. Who could say? We, we, she just looked very, very weathered. And her eyes, though, were kind of told the story. They were, to me, brilliant. But anyway, we were told by this one person that was helping take care of her at the time, you should peel the bananas and break off pieces and, and give the peel banana to her. So her name was Mai Ama. And so we gave these, we had a huge bunches of these red bananas, very tasty. And she started breaking off a piece and giving, say, to Rick. And then she'd break off another piece. And there was a dog between Rick and Steve, and she'd give it to the dog. Mm -hmm. And then she'd break off another piece. And her same hand it was in this, you know, street dog's mouth was now going in my mouth. And then it was going into the next guy's mouth and the next dog's mouth. And she kept repeating this cycle over and over. And we, we were just like the dogs. We didn't, we weren't. We had no air of understanding of anything. We were just fortunately just doing as, as we were kind of instructed to do. And she just fed us for like 20 minutes. Bite here, bite here, dog, person, dog, person, around and around. And it was, you know, quite a fascinating experience because as she came to hand it to you, you, know, you looked her in the eye. And, and I always felt like, well, there's something behind those eyes that are not just not some old village lady. So that was our experience with Mayama. And then at some point later on, I met a Swami who had lived for, I believe, a decade at 15,000 feet without coming down much up above Gomuk Gangotri, up a place called Tapaban. He lived up there in, in very sparse and austere conditions. He, his name was Swami Ram Kripalu. He is told the story that he had gone down to Kanyakumari to have the darshan of this uh, yogini, this avadut yogini. And he said when he got down there, she wasn't there. That, that he had heard that she was out in the ocean. And he was told that she didn't float around on driftwood, that she just lived in the ocean, which was a stretch. <laughs> yeah. But having been in India, I was willing to accept anything if, it, you know, if they could prove it, at least come close to proving. So he said that he prayed to her and prayed to her and prayed to her. And after a couple of hours, she came walking out of the ocean. And as she did, as she came the dog the population of the dogs in the village all were on the beach and when she got onto the sand the beach the, the dogs just converged on her like bees on a on a on a hive he couldn't even see her mm. and then the same ritual that we had gone through happened again he was told to give her a banana and she would do the right call prasad give the, the blessing that's how she blessed people and Ram Kripalu, the Swami from the Himalayas, said she gave the dog a bite, and then the next dog a bite, and then she was about to put it in my mouth, and she, and he said I put my hands up, and that really disturbed her, and she slapped him, hit him, slapped him really hard across the face, mm -hmm. and at that instant he knew exactly the mistake he'd made. He's a high Brahmin, you know, by birth, and Brahmins don't do anything with dogs, you know, right. the, and, you know, and we all have pets as dogs, but he, he and then he realized his mistake and you don't think, don't, can't remember whether he kind of rebounded and said, yes, please give me, I don't, uh, that part is, it eludes my mind, my memory, but anyway, he told us a big lesson for him, yeah. that his arrogance of being somehow too high of, of a soul to do this Prissy. Yeah. was mistake. Yeah. There was a third. There's, there's stories of Shankar with dogs, you know, and, and uh, sort of. Um, Yudhisthira with his dog. Yeah, right? there's that one at the end of the Mahabharata, and and but also I think Shankar or was it Shankar who, who encountered some dog on the road and was like, "Don't oh, get away from you, dog." And then it turned out it was Lord Shiva who, yeah, yeah, disguising yeah. himself as a dog. These are the kind of test tests, his uh, <laughs> the cosmic humility. <laughs> There was one other little story that involved an Ama devotee who had gotten restless. Ama's ashram was only two hours from that place in Kanyakumari, at most two and a half hours, I believe, out in the backwaters in Kerala. And he got restless, as people are, or happen to 
have happened when they sit in the ashram. And so he, he went on a pilgrimage without telling anyone, including not telling Alma. And he went down to this place and had this same saint's uh, uh, darshan. Again, he did the same thing that, that Swami uh, Ram Kripalu did. He rejected the prasad. You know, just thinking, hey, this is, doesn't have to, we don't need to do this. You know, I just wanted to see you and have your darshan. Yeah. He goes back to Alma's ashram and within a day or two, he's developing a huge stomach problem. He's like, you know, cramping and big pain. It really feel, feels serious to him. And he goes to Alma and said, Alma, I'm having a horrible problem. My stomach, I feel really sick. And Alma very innocently using her greater omniscient capacity, I'm imagining, said, son, <laughs> did you go on a pilgrimage recently? And she goes, yes, oh, I did. I was so restless. I, I said, I understand. She said, I understand. Did you go to Kanyak to this place and have a prasad from some saintly person? And he goes, yes, Amma, I was there. And he said, did you, son, did you take, accept the prasad? I said, Amma. And he told the story of the dogs and everything. She says, she, and so Amma goes, son, you need to go immediately directly back to her and accept her blessing because it was a blessing mm -hmm. and then I think things will be fine and she's and things were fine yeah. so he didn't tell her the story she just you know saw however she saw and I mean that's a that's an example in my mind of how a saint uses their their consciousness to help a person in a tight spot and, yeah so. and I mean it's also an example of how things aren't necessarily as they appear and they don't necessarily conform to our our structured notions of of what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's pure, what's impure, and so on. There was a, a story in my interview the last week with um, a fellow who uh, told a story about how these two wealthy women from New York City went to see Edgar Casey, oh, wow. and uh, back in the day when he well, was that yeah, they're very, very wealthy women. So they went down there and they said, you know, Edgar, um, we have Virginia, this Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach. We have this brother who um, inherited a third of the fortune. We have the other two-thirds. He squandered it. He now lives under a bridge in New York City. Uh, we don't know what to do. If, if we give him any more money, he'll squander that. Uh, you know, so we're stuck. And so Edgar Casey went into a trance, and he, when he came out, he said, this man who lives under the bridge is probably the most highly evolved person I've ever done a reading on. Um, and he's, he, he, he agreed to take on this role uh, in order to, you know, teach you to a lesson, I guess, or to serve some kind of function in the in your karmic dynamics, you know, that um, the three of you agreed upon before you came into this life. Um, so anyway, I just tell this story. Probably people who listen to Bat Guy regularly heard it last week, but um, it, it's an example of how we shouldn't be so cocksure of what, or judgmental of you know th the, about the way things are, and kind of you know be a little bit more pliable and absolutely ju not r jump to conclusions. <laughs> you know, Keisha one time said to me, he said, "There is more love than oxygen on this earth." But who would know it? Mm, yeah. He said, if you just don't make any assumption about this person's status in life, maybe they irritate you, maybe you know, at least have a neutral um, outlook toward them and your friends you love, your family you love, your enemies, there's a lesson there, but just take a neutrality as far as you go. Yeah. You know, you don't expose, if the person's approaching you with a knife, you don't you know, say, hey, please hug me. Right, right. You know, but it's like uh, that story in the, in the Buddha tradition is said, you know, if I fed myself to the first tiger that come along, he's going to be hungry again tomorrow. Yeah. So, so you don't feed yourself to a tiger just because the animal's hungry. So right. there's a, there's, you, you have to look at all angles of, of the circumstance, maybe. Mm. Yeah, well, there are many more things that you and I could talk about, I'm sure. Um, you know, we didn't even get into the whole thing about absolute body, rainbow body, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we've been going on for quite a while, and we, we alluded to that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so you working on any more books? The, the novel stands on its own mm -hmm. as, a, as a piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. But I have the rough draft for, it's called the Nirvana Chronicles. So I have a rough, about 200 pages of a rough draft to book two and a full outline to book three. 
Um, and I want to see the traction and the enthusiasm. Yeah. And I've had some lovely reactions. I have a neighbor who asked if he could, if he should read. I said, yeah, you, you probably enjoy it. He read it three times. Wow. Now, I mean, not everybody, you know, and I don't know why he read it three times, but he said I, I, I loved it. And oh. uh, this morning I, I got a email from a monk in Germany mm -hmm. saying I just read the other one, India Mirror of Truth, and he said, thank you so much for opening my heart to India because I hadn't had my that feeling about India yeah. prior to reading that. So um, I love to write, and I will probably continue on with the, the trilogy. I've, I I want to. I, I just am at kind of a interlude here. Yeah. And, and huh. want to see how it. Well, I, my problem is I interview somebody. Every I know you week. do. Yeah, yeah. Everyone gives you their it's book like and say please. The guy, the guy who's coming up next has about five hundred pages awesome. worth of stuff, <laughs> and I don't usually get through it all. But um, but um, we'll see. I'd like to finish it. I was really enjoying the story. Um, and uh, so those of you who, who have time to read, <laughs> uh, you might enjoy these books. And I'll link to them both from Steve's page on batgap.com. I imagine they're on Well, I want to mention as, as a wrap-up for the books that the first book was just mostly uh, started with um, letters to friends back in the States. Yeah. And when I met Keshava, he said, he said, R write your book. And I said, I don't have a book in mind. He said, no, no, start writing and see. And so he kind of pushed me into that one. And then I finished it. And then in the encounter with him, when I referred to him as appearing as a cat, mm -hmm. at, at that time, he suggested, try your hand at fiction. I go, I said, fiction? <laughs> so um, there we have it. And, and I don't know. I mean, I, in a sense, I... Uh, the thrill and the joy and the creativity of writing was plenty reward for yeah, me. Yeah. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is fun when you're in the groove and you're, you're writing something. And it, it really you're in the zone. Yeah. You get in the zone. Neat. And, well, we, and then we're finishing where we started, talking yeah, about the zone. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Steve. And thanks um, for having me. Yeah. Rick, I appreciate it's it. It's been good. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll do another one, maybe when Volume 2 comes out or something, okay. get into other topics. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to talk about any of these topics. Yeah. I, I really... So thank you to those who've been listening or watching. Um, you'll find a link to, well, there'll be a page about Steve and this, on this, in this interview on batgap.com, link to his books. And um, do you want to be in touch with people? I mean, do you have time to, I, like, I, to well, correspond? I make the time. I, I got this email from the German guy this morning. I, I took the time. I want to take the time. I mean, okay. If I have a 1,000 suddenly uh, in, in my box, then yeah. it'll take me more time, but I will still take the time because I feel like... Um, this is a so bit is, far... is there contact info on your website or how to contact you? Yeah, the the website has a, an email address, and I believe it's this one that's on my website also. Yeah. The, All right. Well, since you're putting it right on your book, I'll also put it on on your Batgap page as well as the you know link to your website. And if people want to get in touch, they can. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I there is not anything to do with. Finances with this, it'd be just if, my pleasure if there's a question or something. I, I'm not going to say, okay, you, you got 20 minutes of my time now, you yeah. know, pay me on PayPal for this. No. It's just, it'll just be as best I can do as, as a fellow traveler on the on yeah. spiritual path. Okay, great. Well, thanks. No, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's great. Yeah. And great thanks time. to those who've been listening or watching. Okay. See you for the next one.